All right. So, so the first thing is chromosome theory of inheritance. The chromosome theory of inheritance is basically applying everything that Mendel did to chromosomes. Because if you go back to Mendel, he did not know about chromosomes, mitosis, meiosis, DNA. He used words like there are factors that determine traits. He only knew what the offspring looked like. He couldn't see inside their cells. So the chromosome theory of inheritance, you're going to recognize most of this. It says, first of all, that genes have specific loci on chromosomes. This word loci, some people ask me about the meaning of it. The singular of it is locus, and it literally just means location. So they're basically saying that what a gene really is, these letters Mendel's were Mendel was using, are actually just specific spots on the chromosomes. And that the chromosomes, he said there were factors that separated and got passed on. We know that those factors he was talking about today, we know those are chromosomes. So chromosomes are the things that were undergoing the principle of segregation, and the chromosomes were the things that were undergoing the principle of independent assortment. Again, we already went through all of this. Um, this is just the application of taking what Mendel knew and applying it to chromosomes. Third, uh, that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in somatic cells. How many are in a gamete? Oh, There's 46 in a somatic cell, 23 pairs. In a gamete, how many are there? Just 23. It's not pairs. 22 of those pairs are called autosomes, and then what's the last pair? The sex chromosomes, right. So again, we covered this. We talked about all of this in the chapter on mitosis and meiosis. We have talked about autosomes and sex chromosomes. Uh, we actually already did um, karyotypes, and we looked at disorders, and that's going to come up again in this chapter. So all of that stuff is not going to be new to you. It's all going to be reviewed. That's why, like I said, this chapter is not going to have a huge amount of new material. All right, so that's called the chromosome theory of inheritance. The idea that genes are on chromosomes and that chromosomes are the actual units that Mendel didn't know existed, but he knew that they, he called them factors. All right, um, a gene, again, if I was to take a picture of a gene, it would literally be like that. It would be a little section of a chromosome. All right, and again, if I refer it to a picture, the law of segregation is basically referring to the fact that the chromosomes separate, and his law of independent assortment was referring to the fact that the chromosomes line up randomly. So again, you don't need to know this picture. It's just showing that Mendel's principles apply to chromosomes. And that's just showing the gametes that can be made. All right, so that brings us to something that is new, sex-linked traits. They are discovered by uh, a guy named Thomas Hunt Morgan. He, you don't have to know his name. Um, but if you were asked about a good uh, thing to work with for genetics crosses, fruit flies are one of those examples that are really good to work with. And that's what he worked with. Why are they so good to work with? Well, they only have eight total chromosomes, four pairs. They're easy to breed. You can fit a hundred of them in a little tiny vial. They have a lifespan, I want to say it's only like 14 days. Their entire life cycle is 14 days long. Uh, one female can have 100, lay 100 eggs after she mates once. So, so you, can, you can make lots of babies in a short period of time, and it makes them really, really easy to study. Um, and something that Mendel never saw, these do have sexes like we do, XX and XY, males and females. So he was able to study traits that are on one of those chromosomes, which is not something that Mendel could do. So what he would do is occasionally a fly would come out with a mutation. Today, if we were going to do a lab of flies, I could literally call up the company and say, send me red-eyed flies and white-eyed flies, or wingless flies, or uh, rod-shaped eye flies, or there's all kinds of mutations. We could order them. He just crossed the flies and waited until one with a mutation appeared. He would call the ones with the mutation mutants, and he would call the ones that were normal wild type. A lot of times wild types indicated as a W, or it could even be another another letter, but they use like the plus. The plus usually means it's the, the common version of the trait. Typically it's the dominant version of the trait. You should be used to seeing superscripts because we used superscripts before. We used them for blood types, and when we worked out those problems with the chinchilla trait, those, those colorations, we used superscripts. So rather than capital and lowercase letters, he 
he used oftentimes a superscript. So anyway, he would cross the mutant flies with the others and then see what kind of offspring he got. And that way he could determine if this mutant trait that he was studying was dominant or recessive or how it was passed on. So probably his most famous cross that he's known for is this one. He crossed white-eyed males with red-eyed females. And in the F1, all the offspring came out with red eyes, which is exactly what we would expect. What does that tell us about eye color? That red's dominant to white. What do you think? Oh, yes. So the white eye, good question. The white eye is a mutation. So the white eye is the mutant one. So we would expect, if this was a regular Mendel cross, if you do the F1, you would expect that you'd cross big R, little r with big R, little r, and you'd expect three-fourths with red eyes and one-fourth with white eyes. But when he did the F2 cross, that's not what he found out. He found that all the females in the F2 came out with red eyes, but the males came out one-to-one, -one, meaning half, half of the males had red eyes, half of the males had white eyes. So he knew something else was going on here, that it wasn't just a regular three-to-one, that there was something different between the sexes. Something, it had something to do with their sex chromosomes. So he called this a sex-linked trait. And henceforth, this is the way we're going to represent sex-linked traits. Um, a lot of times, by the way, these are not called sex-linked. You may even see them referred to as X-linked because 99% of sex-linked traits are carried on the X. So you should never question, like if they say sex-linked, you don't need to go, well, do they mean sex-linked on the X or the Y? You can assume they mean on the X. Because the Y chromosome mainly just determines making you a male. There's only, there's very, very few genes on there. So if they say a trait is sex-linked, you can assume they mean it's on the X. Anyway, this is how we write it. So females will be X letter, X letter. So it could be like X big A, X little A. Uh, you could even see X plus, X without the plus. Uh, in this case, I had X big N, X big N. These would be all different ways that you could see a female written. A male, on the other hand, um, would have a letter only on his X and not on his Y. So you could see X big N Y, X little a Y, X plus Y, but you will never ever write a letter on the Y. And that's kind of the rookie mistake that you see the freshmen make, is that they don't understand that the Y is a completely different chromosome. And this makes these traits very unique because males only have one X. So there's no such thing as a male being heterozygous. In other words, if this is a trait, for example, colorblindness is a trait in humans, um, the only way I could be colorblind is I'd have to be X little a, X little a. I would have to have inherited a copy of the bad X from my mom and a copy from my dad. But males only have one X. So they're going to basically either be colorblind or not colorblind. There is no case where they can get a good copy that's going to mask the other one. So sex link traits are going to end up being a lot more common in males. So here's a sample problem. Hemophilia, which is a blood clotting disorder, um, you basically bleed very, very easily, uh, is, is a sex linked recessive trait. Again, x linked and sex linked are two ways to write the same thing. So a normal female could be written X big N, X big N, or if she's heterozygous, X big N, X little N. Either way, she would not actually show the trait. In fact, the term for this would be a carrier because she carries the trait, but she doesn't actually show any symptoms because it's recessive. Um, our female that has hemophilia would be X little N, X little N. A male that's normal would be X big and Y, and a male that has hemophilia, X little and Y. Again, notice there's no such thing as a male carrier. Because he either has it or he doesn't. He can't be heterozygous. So the, so the guy only needs one, but that's it. Correct, in order to show the trait. Yes. That's a good question. So this guy... Where would he have gotten this? Would he have gotten it from his mom or his dad? He would have had to have gotten it from his mom because what do we know he had to get from his dad? The Y, because only males carry the Y. So that's actually another thing about sex-linked traits is that if, if a guy has a sex-linked trait, he never got it from his dad. He always got it from his mom because in order to be a male, he got the Y from his dad, which also means that if you were a male and you had a sex-linked trait, 
like hemophilia, as long as you gave birth to sons, you would never ever have to worry about passing the trait on. Because you would never pass the trait to your sons because you'd give your sons the Y. And chances are your daughters wouldn't have the trait either. Because in order for, like I said, a girl to have the trait, you would have to have gotten a copy from dad and a copy from mom. So, for example, we could try crossing a normal female with a hemophiliac male. So, we have a guy, X little n y, he actually has hemophilia. Let's cross him with a, a, a female that does not carry it. She's completely normal. Most of these traits, like I said, are not very common in the population. So, this could, this could be a, a, a possible trait you could see, or Punnett score you could see. Um, you can do, just like we did before, you can make your Punnett square with just one X here, since this is the same, big N, big N, you can make it two boxes or you can make it four. But since she's uh, homozygous, you don't have to make four boxes. Well, any of these children actually have hemophilia? No. There is a zero chance of any of their kids having hemophilia. Now, you could say that their, their, their girls will be carriers, but they'll never actually have hemophilia. In fact, let's take a look at how uh, a girl could get hemophilia. Let's try crossing instead. Let's take our female and make her heterozygous. So we're going to cross a female that carries hemophilia. Let's cross her with a normal male. So this time, the, the dad is normal, but the mom is a carrier of hemophilia. This time, let's take a look. Do any of their daughters have hemophilia? So their daughters would be completely safe, all normal, even though mom carries it. How about the sons? One out of the two, right? So the chances of a son having it would be half and half, but there'd be no chance of a daughter if a mom was a carrier. So the only way we can get a daughter that has the trait is we'd have to have a mom that at least carries it, like this mom, but we'd have to cross her with a dad that has it. And again, most of these traits are very rare. Not only are they mostly very rare, but some of them are deadly. Like Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, is, is a sex-linked trait. Um, and that particular kind of muscular dystrophy causes devastating effects. Most males that have it would die probably before they could have kids, which means you'd probably never, ever see it in a female. Because if all the guys that have the trait die before they can pass it on, then a girl, even if her mom's a carrier, she's always going to get a good copy from dad. Yes? So let's say um, uh, the guys are more prone to hemophilia than girls? Yes, and they're more likely to inherit it than girls. Um, and I'm sure you could find females that have it. Um, this is actually a family tree of the royal family, one of the royal, some of the royal families. You can see Victoria and Albert back here. This is um, Nicholas and Alexandra that were assassinated. Um, the, all this red area. But notice hemophilia, this is hemophilia in the royal family. First of all, let me make a comment. The reason why it's so common, because all the green is people that either carry it or have it, is because there's a lot of inbreeding in the royal family. Uh, it's never good if you trace back your family tree and find out that your mom's sister is your, is your husband's mom, which is basically what that is. And even this with Philip and Elizabeth, if you trace it back, they're like third or fourth cousins. Like this traces back to this guy, and this one traces back to this mom, which means back here, like four generations back, they were brother and sister. So that's one of the reasons why it's so common. But what I really want you to see from this um, is notice you have to be fully colored in to have hemophilia. Circles are females and squares are males. There are no females that actually have hemophilia. All these colored ones are males because they only need one copy to have it. Our females are our carriers. They're the ones that passed it to all the males. Um, so it's kind of interesting to look at, and that's a very common thing. We're going to learn how to read pedigrees as part of this chapter, but that kind of gives you an idea of how they work. Here's the conclusions, just to wrap it up. These traits are more common in males because they only have one X. They're always given to males by their mom because dads give the Y, so you're not going to get a, a male's not going to get it from their, their dad. And then this is a, a one sample cross to wrap things up. All right, so... We cross a tortoise shell female with a black male. So here's your cross, tortoise shell female, black male. Usually on these, you separate your males and females. So here's my females. I get half tortoise shell, half black. And then here's my males. I get 
half black, half yellow. You can't just say one-fourth tortoiseshell.